Huddled against the chill, they sleep, restoring themselves for their next meeting with the bowhead. But during this particular pause, the north wind continues to intensify, and in the morning, they wake up to the unexpected. The night wind has driven an iceberg against the huge flow where they have camped, and now the ice underfoot is groaning and breaking up. No time now for tea and fish. They must move and move quickly or they'll find themselves adrift in the Arctic Sea. disassembled and loaded aboard sleds and with little time to spare. Very soon now the ice will be breaking faster than a man can run. The journey to the next location will cover only seven miles but virtually every foot along the way will be an effort. Snowmobiles are no help here Hour after hour, they hack away at the jacket ice, clearing a narrow passage for the sled, which must be hauled by hand, the old way, the way of their fathers. This spring, they have been lucky. Other years, the cruel north wind has forced them to move three, four times a day, often in the middle of the shortening night. The struggle goes on, mile after mile, and each man, as if bound by tradition, bears his load with a stoicism that only the Arctic could possibly demand. Eleven hours later, the struggle ends, but it was worth it, for here the ice is solid, the sea calm, and the wind blows gentle and warm. And so, once again, they set up camp. And through the glimmering night, they rest, assured by the radio of clear skies and soft winds for tomorrow. But in the morning, the weather plays another cruel trick. Now the air is thick with moisture and cold enough to congeal the seawater into a gray field of slush. Visibility has been cut in half, and each stroke of the paddle is hard labor now. By midday, the Umiaks out on patrol bog down, their crews close to exhaustion and running dangerously low on spirit. Then hope comes rolling through a lead in the ice. A herd of belugas and small white whales, 15 footers, Almost certainly, they are followed by the bowhead. And the Eskimos, reaching down into a diminishing reservoir of strength, move their umiaks into position. Numbering more than 20 boats, the whaling fleet stretches itself over a mile along the path taken by the belugas path followed by the bowhead, if it follows. <laughs> the crews grow impatient, especially the younger members. Some suggest they kill the belugas, but they vote to let them pass. 
gambling that the huge bowhead will follow, and they'll need only one kill to feed their village. Crouching motionless, they watch the belugas pass beyond reach, and now the die is cast. If the bowhead does not follow in their wake, second thoughts will be heatedly expressed by the younger members of the fleet. black image a triumph for these men who've worked so hard to see it. Had must still pass several more boats strung out along the edge of the flow. Bowhead's movements. And almost immediately he sounds. Together they pray that the lance will hold firm and that he will not swim under the ice and die there. flag is flown, marking the spot of the kill. And now all the whalers converge on the carcass. Butchering a bowhead is a long process in which every ounce of the 60,000 pounds is regarded as useful. The meat is cut into steaks of varying sizes and distributed to members of the crew according to their involvement in the kill. Not only will the blubber be eaten next winter, but it will provide oil to light the long night. The baleen, the filtering gills, will be woven into baskets and matting for their homes. Even the intestine is considered a delicacy. Finally, the whalers divide up their catch, the largest portions going to the captain of the crew that struck the whale. It has taken nearly a full day to butcher and divide the great bowhead, and now each member heads home, dead tired, but deeply in touch with his past, at least for another year.
back at Point Hope, the entire village gathers to celebrate the taking of the whale. As I strolled among the crowd, a modern 35mm camera snapped away as the victorious crews hauled their umiaks and whaling gear to a prominent place so that boat as well as hunter could be honored. As I watched proceedings, I realized that this special reverence the Eskimo has for his tools will last only so long as he builds them himself. But otherwise, I might have been attending a New England clam bake or a Sunday picnic, except perhaps for a few subtleties. One not so subtle difference was the food, which in no way resembled chicken or lobster. But as someone once said, you haven't been to the north until you've tried whale, especially the intestine. I wondered whether they were passing the plate or the buck. Then it was my turn. No, that's fine, Lord. Thank you. So just pop it in, huh? Yeah, chew on it. Chew it good. Huh? Chew it good. It's tough. Yeah. It's better with salt. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed some people. You swallow it or do you? Swallow it. Chew it all up and swallow it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say. I think it tastes good. Still chewing. No. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. After the festival, as I walked alone through the graveyard of the whales, their great curved bones beseeching the Arctic heavens, I was fully aware that the movement to ban whaling throughout the world must rightfully apply to the Eskimo as well as other men. I realized, too, that the price the Eskimos will pay reaches far beyond lost profit. Whale bones and crosses stand against the Arctic sky. The wind blows through the graveyard where our fallen fathers lie. Eternal snow that covers them the shadows of the sun, the mighty struggle on the seas, a way of life is run. I'll sing for you, my father. For the ancient sacred way How the hunter loves the hunted How the night becomes the day 
the circle of the mighty spirit keep us in its fold. The warmth of understanding like a light shot through the cold. Then bring to me my people Touch them with your loving hands. Lead them from confusion. Lead them back unto the land. For sin that seems to block their path, it clouds my people's eyes. The promise that an idol truth will reap a golden light. Whale bones and crosses stand against the Arctic sky. The wind blows through the graveyard where our fallen fathers lie. The timeless hunt, a journey back to what we once came from. Compassion and nobility beneath the midnight the mighty struggle on the seas, the way of life is We left Point Hope and flew farther north to a place where life will never change. The most forbidding place on earth, the polar cap. I remember every detail. I was flying with Tony Oni while Hoppy was riding shotgun off to our left. This was Hoppy's favorite part of the North because, as he puts it, there are no excuses out here. And after one look, I knew what he meant. This had to be the loneliest, most desolate place I'd ever seen. And I was very glad we had both planes. Our mission was to photograph the polar bear. You always go out with two planes? Yes, you do. That's your insurance. If you don't have that other airplane, if you had a problem on landing like you knock a ski off, or uh, an engine problem, uh, you couldn't get back by yourself, uh, you, and nobody could find you. I'll tell you, John, one time we got in a deal where there was a dead whale caught in the ice, and the smell, the bear came around it. There must have been 20 bear right around that one whale. The grandest sight I ever saw. Woo! An hour passed, and I knew we had ranged dangerously far out over the ice cap. And as I watched our shadows ghosting over the whiteness, it became very clear why experience is a necessity out here. Landing a plane on that stuff would be a very tricky and treacherous matter. You got it right there! Look at that guy! Woo! That's a nice bear! Wow! Look at 
Look at that guy. Man, that's a nice bear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. his work. 
world, and it sure is all his. Got his nose up. Put his nose up to sniff, huh? sleep cycle? I mean, do they sleep hours or do they just take a rest whenever they feel like it? I imagine they just rest whenever they feel like it. They have very good eyesight. Oh, they do? Yes, they do. Good eyesight, keen ears, and a real terrific nose. He's looking at us. He doesn't know what to think, but he's looking. See him look right over here? Look at that. See him look over yeah. there? He's wondering about us. He's what is that I see over there? Everybody hold real still. He was beautiful. Tony Oni had tried many times to describe how I'd feel when this moment arrived. But now, as I looked at him, I felt something more than awe. I felt all the force of the wilderness flow into me like, like a prayer. He was the wilderness. Powerful, elegant, and complete. I snapped another picture or two, but then I stopped held by the presence of this white animal in this white land. When he stood on his hind legs, I swear he was looking straight into my eyes. When he lumbered off, his great head swinging from side to side and his tongue and nose working the air, I thought of what Tony had said. It's his. All his. I said to myself, so may it be for him. Alone out there on the Alagnac, with a soft summer breeze bringing the night to Alaska, my memory finally let go of that spring trip to the Arctic, and I knew that those experiences would always be with me.
Thank you. Already a little water in there. This was our last day on the Alagna. Just main door. But before we'd reach Hoppy in the bush plains and take off for the Rango Mountains, we still faced the fastest piece of white water on the river, which extends about a mile where the Alagnac squeezes its way and through a tight canyon. The trees, really Next to singing there. and, well, maybe skiing, I guess I like shooting white water more than anything else in the world. Okay. Looks like it's gonna rain on us a little, doesn't it? Well, won't feel so cold when we fall in the river. <laughs> I wish you would. <laughs> Not a chance, Red. Not a chance. We no sooner got out on the river when the sky opened up and a chill rain sifted down on us. But rain or no rain, there was no turning back. We made it, but not without getting soaked to the skin from all directions. And as we rode out the last mile or so of our river journey, before I'd say goodbye to Red and Mike, I just sat there under that chilling rain and I felt warm inside and a little sad, promising myself that someday I'd come back and see my three newfound friends, Mike and Red in the Alagnac River. Now it was on to the Wrangell Mountain. And late that afternoon, there they were. I'd ask Tony that we save the Wrangles for the last stop on our trip because mountains, no matter where they are, they'll always seem like home to me. These peaks are the northern tip of a vast mountain chain that extends some 4,000 miles down through British Columbia and Alberta into the United States where they call them the Rockies. So far, I've flown over 15,000 miles of Alaska with an individual who by now had become a close friend, a friend I know that I'll keep for the rest of my life. From Barrow at the top of the world, to Point Hope, Shishmaref, and the Alagnac, 
He showed me a world I'd only dreamt about, a world more precious to him than practically anything else. We'd seen and done a lot of things, more things than some of us do in a lifetime. And for me, why, each experience had been enjoyable, valuable, yet somehow it all hadn't come together yet. And now I was hoping it would, here in the Wrangell Mountains. to bring her down and there in the middle of nowhere was a landing field and the tiny town of McCarthy but before Tony put her down he made a pass by the original Kennecott mine where 40 years earlier hundreds of men worked the world's largest known copper deposit it was our first stop after we stowed our gear in McCarthy Wow. It started in about 1911. They took out some of the richest ore that they've ever taken out. Copper ore? Copper ore. About 70 or 80 percent copper ore. Made a lot of money on it. How long did it go, Tony? What happened to the place? Oh, it went along good. They were getting a little low on ore, and uh, all of the men voted the, voted the union in in 1938. And so Kennecott gave them two days to, to move it all out. They were going to shut her down. And they just, just like that. Well, oh, it's a beautiful place. Isn't it's it, just though? Beautiful. I love to come here. It's like a movie set, you know what I mean? You know what they ought to have here is a, a chase scene. Boy, that would... A lot of places. You're it. <laughs> and Barrow are a study in opposites. While the Eskimos of Barrow are struggling to climb into the present, the residents of McCarthy cling to the past. They come from all over North America, drifters, most of them, searchers for a clean, well-lighted life, free of highways and 
bad air and dirty politics. Each night, most of the population of 50 or so would gather in the town's only lodge. I'd sing a few songs, and then we would settle down and discuss all sorts of things. But mainly, we talked about life and how to live it. For Joanne Miller, the way was just as clear as the mountain air. Hey, do you know what happened to me? I, I am alive because I learned to live in the mountains. You touch people when you live up here. You touch these people and these people. It's a painful thing to talk about sometimes because I am a dying person because I'm becoming extinct. Extinct, just like the seals and the bears and the eagles. But well, we need you, don't we? Oh my God, you need us. Yes, you need us. You need us for your children. You need us for a heritage here in America. We are your heritage. morning, Hoppy, Tony, and I headed for the high country. And I kept thinking about what Joanne had said the night before. We are your heritage. Joanne might have been speaking for all of Alaska, for all half a million square miles, from the frozen waste of the Arctic to the Aleutian, all the way to the Wrangell, for the Eskimos, the Aleuts, the Indians, for the trappers, the prospectors, the hunters, and the pipeline workers for the rivers still running free in the mountains and the great rolling forest. All of it remaining much as it always was, as the American West was a century ago. Alaska is our past, living in the present. What a luxury to have this second chance. But across the land, I've heard the initial rumbling of progress and seen the spoil change. And I fear for this precious place and its people. And what are the animals? Would the Arctic still call to the spirit without the polar bear roaming its face at will? And what would the Eskimo of Point Hope do if the bowhead no longer arrived in the spring in the Chukchi Sea? What if the brown bear no longer came to feed at the McNeil River because there were no salmon? Or no bear? What then? Well, I think Alaska would be stilled forever. An abandoned temple from another time with different beliefs. The animals are the vital organs of the wilderness, just as they are the barometers of our destructiveness. Here in the Wrangells, for example, what would a climb into the high country be without at least the promise of a site such as this? Look at those horns. Boy, really sharp. They are. And just cold black. I wonder what he's thinking about over there. He's probably saying, I wonder what those yo yo are <laughs> over there. I imagine he's probably had as good a time as I am. There's such a sheep, sheep over there, there. yeah. Oh, right really? Oh, suspicious. Look at that. He's coming on it. Ground in a short time, don't they? Mm -hmm. It takes us 15 minutes to walk over there, and it's about a minute and a half, and they're there. Oh, Tony, this is as beautiful as anything I've ever seen. The only time I can think that it's any prettier is right at sundown. And the coming sundown would mark the end of my trip into the Alaskan wilderness. The next day, I'd board a jet in Anchorage and head south into another life.
So until the sun dropped behind the Wrangles, I sat on that mountain slope with Tony and Hoppy and just took it all in. As the night gathered in the valleys and began swiftly climbing toward us, I watched the doll ram grazing and thought about how much he had in common with Alaska. Strong, majestic, masculine. His future nonetheless hangs by a very thin, almost invisible thread. A thread that could easily be broken by just a touch of carelessness. And then he'd be gone forever. Suddenly it was all over, much too soon. But the memories remain alive and, and compelling, visions merging together in my mind and telling me to return as soon as possible. Because there's a lot going on in Alaska these days, forces working against each other, forces of the past and of the future of passivity and, and aggression. And some are saying that coexistence is impossible. That one side has to lose. Well, I think that's very old fashioned. Alaska's our last chance with the wilderness. Let's not wait until it's too late when the cry across the land will be, bring it back. Bring it back. Let's keep it. Nurture it. Love it. Let it be. It's the American child. The American child is the call of the wild and the sing through the mist of your dream. Does it fly with the wind when you wake and again? When it's gone, do you know what it means? Can you picture the time when man had to find his own way through an unbroken land? Before the machine changed the blue and the green, something you can't understand. The American child has a burning inside because you For all that you've been, can't you see that it's time to go home to the mountains and seas and a frontier of trees on the earth? Who's the mother of all? The promise once made, will it shine? Will it fade? Will we rise with a vision or fall? And I'm